Hey, my name's Nick. If we haven't had the chance to meet before, so good to have you join us today, this Sunday, for our second Sunday back. And it is fitting that we are back in the flesh to celebrate Christmas as well. Uh, So thanks for joining us. If you are uh, new or kind of here first time in a long time, uh, would be good for you to know that we are tracking through and today coming to the end of uh, a series we've been in, in the book of Isaiah, one of which the chapters was just read out for us, Isaiah 40. Uh, This is a book that was written some 2,700 years ago, and yet it speaks into our human experience even today. And so we're going to learn from it again this morning. Uh, While we are either turning there or just preparing our hearts, let's do that by praying to the Lord. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you that your word is truth. Sanctify us in your truth. Lord, we pray that you would come and dwell with us in this moment. We thank you for a moment to gather together, a moment to come before you and a moment to be reminded afresh of who you are, what you have done for us and what Christmas is really all about. Make Jesus big in this moment for us so we might see him and seeing him be changed like him. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Well, today, uh, as I mentioned, we're turning to Isaiah 40, and this chapter was written thousands of years ago, and it held out to the original audience an offer from God, perhaps a gift from God. He's not like Santa Claus, but God does know what we need, and he offers the same gifts to us, his people, this morning, a couple of thousand years later, after Isaiah wrote As we're turning to Isaiah 40, let me tell you a little bit about my day yesterday. Uh, Yesterday at my house, it was just me and the kids all day because my wife Jules was at a wedding down at the Mornington Peninsula and she was involved in the bridal party, which meant that she had to leave the house at an ungodly hour because as all the women know, on a wedding day, makeup takes 78 times longer to apply than normal. Uh, And so she was gone from much of the day. And so that meant that without Jules in the house, something very rare, something amazing happened at the Coombs household yesterday. The cricket was on. Uh, and so I was watching. Ordinarily, I wouldn't give it much time. It's kind of on in the background. But then the wickets started falling. And if you don't know what that means, I can't help you. But people started getting out on the other side. And so my, I was kind of inching forward to the edge of my seat. Axel, my boy, my four-year-old, was there next to me. He was playing a game on his iPad. And it's getting more and more exciting. And then this guy's on a hat trick. If you don't know what that is, I can't help you either. But he's almost going to take three wickets in a row. And like, this is like a once in a lifetime thing. So I'm, I'm kind of elbowing and nudging. Actually, you've got to tune into this, bud. This is amazing. This is incredible what's happening. This is a once in a lifetime moment. And as I did that, he did not want a bar of it. He was consumed with his iPad game, which was a terrible game anyway. Uh, <laughs> consumed with it and said, Dad, no, I don't want to watch. No, I'm not into it. I'm not into it. And while he was his mother's son for not wanting to watch cricket, his reaction showed that he was very much his father's son because it made me think that there must be many, many times where my own ignorance, my uh, youth and immature, I just miss an amazing thing that's happening because I'm consumed with my own things. And it got me thinking that Well, Christmas is actually like that for all of humanity, perhaps every single year. Every year we give it lots of energy, don't we? We've got lots of uh, kind of costumes and carols and decor and presents and the front of houses get transformed and shop windows get transformed. But for all the attention that we give Christmas, we give give it very little thought. And we are perhaps the whole Christmas festive season tuned in to the wrong thing. There is a lot of heat, but not much light. And so today, God wants us to not miss what really matters. He wants our attention on something that is amazing, that is epic, that is awesome. Something that Christmas should highlight for us every year. And so we're going to see what that is in uh, Isaiah 40. Before we get there, let me set the context of the chapter of what is happening here. It's a little bit like a, a letter from God to his people. And it was written by one of the prophets, Isaiah. If you were with us last week, we were just a chapter earlier in Isaiah uh, 36, 37, 38, and 39, where Isaiah was able to tell us about a king, King 
Hezekiah. Uh, and Isaiah told this king that because of your uh, foolishness, because of your fear, because of your pride, your city, Jerusalem, is going to be captured by the foreign Babylonians, the enemy Babylonians, and they are going to take all the people of Jerusalem hostage. They'd be exiled out of God's great city and forced to reside in Babylon, forced to work in uh, slave labor for the Babylonians. Now, just we turn the page to Isaiah 40, but there's a bit of a shift in, in what Isaiah is saying or who he is talking to. Because he wrote the book in the 8th century BC, but Israel, or the city of Jerusalem, didn't get sacked and kind of exiled until 580. BC. So he's, he's looking forward and writing 120 years into the future to those people who are away from home, who are exiled from home. And so Isaiah 40 through 255 is, uh, shifts audience to these people 120 years or so ahead in time. God has a message for them. And his message is what he's using to try to win their heart back before they can physically come back to their city, Jerusalem. Now, this historical moment of the exile is very prominent in the Bible. If you're familiar with the Bible at all, particularly the Old Testament, you might know that this kind of uh, episode in the history of Israel is kind of repeated and led up to, anticipated again and again and again in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, elsewhere. And the reason it's so prominent is because it's a moment, the moment becomes a template for what God wants to do for us. That just as he wants to win their hearts back before they physically come back to Jerusalem, so too he wants to win the hearts of all people back to himself. It is a picture of what God wants to do for us. And so I don't know what faith position you entered in those doors and, and came and sat down with, what convictions you have this morning, wherever you are at, in your own faith. God wants to win your heart back through Isaiah chapter 40. And just as I was nudging my son yesterday, saying, man, bud, you've got to check this out. This is, this is amazing what is happening. God's going to use Isaiah 40 to nudge us and say, hey, you've got you to gotta look. Look up, check this out. Don't miss the amazing things that are happening, which Christmas will remind us of. And so we're not going to walk, the chapter is large. We're not going to walk through it. We're going to jog through Isaiah 40 this morning. Let's first talk about the present God wants to give you this Christmas. Because God has an offer for us in Isaiah 40. It starts out like this. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a, part, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, the rough places are plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so God speaks. The mouth of the Lord has spoken to a broken people, to a weary people, to a hurting people. These people, the original audience, they are separated from family. They are stuck in a foreign city. The borders are closed. They're working harder than ever, but they've had to take an 80% pay cut. They are receiving bad news after bad news after bad news. And then God speaks. And he speaks tenderly. And he wants to comfort them. And he tells them that this season, this exile, it's one day going to come to an end. And it's going to be replaced by comfort, by rest. Be good to know that the terrain east of Jerusalem toward Babylon, the, the kind of pathways and the terrain which the uh, people from Judah would have to walk through to come back home, was, is known for being mountainous. Uh, so God is saying that the valleys are going to come up. The mountains are going to be made low and I'm going to walk you home in comfort, in peace, in rest. And God's not merely talking about some physical comfort and some physical rest. He's not merely offering the people, hey, one day you're going to have, be able to put your feet up. No, God is offering them a chance to find themselves again. A chance to have an identity that holds them a peace that settles them on the inside in a way that lasts to finally feel 
at home again. And God offers this not just to them 2,700 years ago, but he offers it to us today, to you today. In many ways, we have had an exiled experience this year, separated and locked down. And hasn't it shown us that human life is not just about human life? It's not just about having human DNA and having human biology. No, we are far more than physical specimens. That when we get locked down, we don't just feel that we are physically closed up. Something happens inside of us. There is a hunger and a thirst to relate to others, a desire to be free, something deeper in us than mere biological survival. It's because all of us have a soul within us, a soul that is longing for, yearning for rest, to be settled, to be at home. Uh, One of the church fathers, a fourth century author and theologian, Augustine, he once said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. And this is the kind of comfort and rest that Isaiah 40 is talking about. This is the, the gifts that God is offering to us this Christmas. A rest that is better than summer holidays at the end of the year. It is a spiritual settling, an opportunity for your soul to stop searching, to finally breathe in and say, I've arrived. I've been found. I'm home. And we see this in God's words because he he mentions that for his people, he says, their warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. So God is not just talking about physical comfort and rest. He's bringing up spiritual categories here. He's talking about iniquity. He's offering forgiveness to pardon it, that that all our attempts to find rest, to find that sense of home in other things can actually be forgiven and forgotten. And then later he says in verse five, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so God is offering us the opportunity for comfort, rest that lasts, forgiveness, and the opportunity to see God, to be with God, to be reunited with him, reconciled in our relationship with the one who made us. As Augustine said, that our heart might rest in him. Now, there's something particularly powerful about reunion moments. Perhaps you've experienced some with family recently. Uh, I remember as a kid, I got very used to going to the international arrivals area of the airport because my dad would travel a lot for weeks at a time. And I got so used to it that I used to just go as in my pajamas uh, as a kid. Uh, And so I remember again and again uh, hanging out in the international arrivals area. And the international arrivals area, ordinarily, not this year, like many things, ordinarily it is the happiest place on earth. In years to come, if you ever need a shot in the arm of encouragement or building up, I mean, the the drive out to the airport will frustrate the heck out of you. And then you'll get there and you'll be built up. Because what happens is you see joy. People with their little trolleys, they come out of the the doors open up and then they're coming out and they're, they're searching and searching for whoever. And then there's like this little faint squeal somewhere. And then a whole family kind of runs around and they meet together and then there's louder squeals and there's joy and there's hugs and there's weeping. It's incredible. And that experience, that moment, is actually what God wants to experience with each one of us. That he is waiting for that experience with each one of us, the chance to have reconciliation, reunion, joy with him. That we can have our soul find rest by finally being reconciled with the one who made us. And as we see in this chapter, he's not just the one who made us, but the one who made us also loves us and is committed to doing all that needs to be done for our souls to come home to him. And so God wants to give us that this Christmas. There might be some presents under your tree right now. They are not this 
God wants to offer you this this morning. And he tells us, tells us how he, he goes about letting us know, how he goes about offering it to us. In uh, verse 6, he starts talking about his word. He says, a voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. And so God invites us to hear a word. God invites the world. He's, he's telling Isaiah, hey, Go get up on a mountain and shout it out to everybody. God's offer of comfort and rest comes not just from men and women, not from human flesh. Our lives are but a vapor, like the, the steam above the kettle when you turn it on this morning. There for a moment and then invisible and gone. But God's word comes not from men and women like us, but rather from his very mouth. It comes through his word. And so this is why we are big on the Bible. This is why we spend six and a half minutes with a video Bible reading. Because we don't just want to hear from me. It's not just human speculation about God. This is God's revelation to us of him revealing himself, pulling the curtain away to show himself to us. And so what's important this morning is not that you hear from me, but that you hear from him, that we turn to his word. And God wrote this in a way through Isaiah that was pressing 100 years ago, but because it's from God himself, it's also pressing for us today. It's important for us today. It's a message for us today. It's good news for us today. And that last line tells us what is best about the good news. Behold your God. What is best about the Bible that in it, we get to behold God. And that's what he turns to next as he goes on to tell us how he's going to secure for us what he offers us, comfort, rest, forgiveness, and freedom. And so let's look at the giver himself. God goes along and starts talking about himself. Verse 10, behold, the Lord God comes with might. And his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead those that are with young. And God uh, goes on to talk about himself in mighty and massive waves. If we read on, we'd see that he holds the water of the world, all the oceans, all the rivers, all the seas in the palm of his hand that he can measure the whole universe with the span of his fingers. He didn't need any consultants, no architects, no subcontractors to create the world. Compared to him, every president, every power, every political movement, every platform is as nothing. And we're told that this God, with how big he is, is coming. He is coming into the world to, to rescue his people and to gather them to himself. And there's a very significant connection here. If you're familiar with the Christian story, the Christmas story, you'll know that there's a significant connection here to what we've just read and what would happen some 700 years later. We saw before a voice crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. And when we read the Christmas story, we know that the very earliest Christians connected what they saw play out between Jesus and his cousin John the Baptist and what Isaiah said. In one of the biographies of Jesus, uh, Luke, in Luke 1 and 2, it tells the story of the birth of Jesus and the birth of John, his cousin, before him. And then John starts preaching and teaching and every single one of the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every single one of them. And you know it's important, particularly important, if every single one of them are drawing the link. They quote what we just read from Isaiah 40. And they say, hey, this is what John was doing. 
It says this in Luke 3. It says, And he went into all the region around the Jordan. That's John. Proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And every crooked shall become straight. And the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And so when we read that, hey, one day God will come, we know that 700 years later, the promise was ultimately fulfilled because God came by taking on flesh and wrapping his glory, his might, his massiveness, his majesty in his son, Jesus Christ. The massive and mighty hands that span the universe came down to us and became little tiny baby hands who wrapped themselves around the pinky of his mother Mary. The creativity, the power that dwarfs everything that you or I have ever seen that put all the stars in the sky and put our hearts in our chest with just a word, let there be. And there was. That power came down to us in the weakness and the meekness of a little baby And he was coming to use all of that power to win our eternal comfort and rest and bring us back to God. And so behold, the Lord has come. Jesus, the Emmanuel, God with us. And it's amazing to think that a God so powerful, so powerful that he describes himself In verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. It's amazing that God, who is that mighty, would become a baby. And yet not just become a baby, because as that baby would grow up in his physical strength, he would actually even go lower and submit himself even further. Submitting himself to be betrayed, to be beaten, to be bashed and then bloodied on a cross. And so this God who is massive and mighty in Isaiah 40 becomes a God who suffers and is scorned for us. And he did it because the great power that we read of here is matched by God's great love for us. For you, for me. In another letter in the New Testament, written by one of Jesus' closest friends, John, it says, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that he, we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so God sent his son into the world in the very first Christmas that we might, did you see it, live through him. And so that yearning for peace, that yearning for rest, that need for comfort beyond mere physical comfort, that need for deeper, internal, soul-satisfying comfort was coming to us. In Jesus, that in him we might truly live. And so Jesus came as the only one who could secure life for us. And he secured it in the life he lived for us. He secured it in the death he died for us. He secured it in rising again, in having paid the penalty for sin and having put away death, suffering, and evil. And so this Christmas, you can find comfort and rest in Jesus. This Christmas, God has made you an offer. Put the gifts at the bottom of the tree just for you. Eternal comfort, rest, peace, reconciliation with him, forgiveness, sins, put away. And then he actually did what needed to be done to secure that present for you by sending his own son in your place for you. And so he has done it all. And now we look, well, how then do we receive it? 
What, what, what do we do to receive what God has done? And so how do we unwrap the gift that God has won for us? Look with me to verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Viktor Frankl was one of Europe's leading psychiatrists in the mid 20th century. Up until 1942, where during World War II he was uh, arrested and taken to live for three years in Nazi concentration camps. And being a psychiatrist uh, in that environment, he was very interested in observing the dynamics play out, the people around him, especially the differences he saw in the prisoners who survived, thrived, if you can, and others who died. And that findings or his observations became a book that you might have heard of before, Man's Search for Meaning. In it, he writes this, The prisoner who had lost faith in the future, his future, was doomed. With his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual hold. He let himself decline and became subject to mental and physical decay. Usually this happened quite suddenly in the form of a crisis, the symptoms of which were familiar to the experienced camp inmate. Usually it began with the prisoner refusing one morning to get dressed or wash or go out in the parade grounds. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. He just lay there, hardly moving. If this crisis was brought about by an illness, he refused to be taken to the sick bay or to do anything to help himself. He simply gave up. There he remained, lying in his own excreta, and nothing bothered him anymore. And we read from this account, that there's something very, very, very powerful about hope. Something that sustains us about hope, that keeps us going, that gives us strength, that once it's gone, we perish. Now, many of us at the back end of this year have, have kind of perhaps had our hope etched away over time. The things that we had hoped in were threatened and we were lost. What Isaiah is revealing to us in this passage is that the way that we can find comfort and rest and forgiveness in Christ, to be restored and reconciled to our maker, to God himself, then we need to, verse 31, wait for the Lord. In other words, have our hope in the Lord. Bank our future on the Lord. Put our faith in in the Lord. We need to see that Jesus has come, not just miraculously, not just historically, but personally and purposefully with a mission, a mission to save you, a mission to bring you back to Him, a mission to wipe away your debt, forgive you of your sin, to come and die a death in your place, to come and win you your salvation, win your life back, Exchange your weariness, your tiredness, that soul hunger with rest and with comfort in Him. And so we can put our hope for the future in what Jesus has done for us in the past. And so unwrapping the gift of God's grace to us is as simple as waiting on Him, entrusting our lives to Him while we still live in this world. It is very simple. And yet at the same time, it is also very costly. Because I don't know about you, but waiting sucks. I hate waiting. If I'm in a line, if I'm on the phone, whenever I'm waiting, I'm thinking about what else I could be doing while I'm waiting. And if you're a Christian, you probably have the same experience with your Christian life. It's very similar to waiting. Because as we hope in the Lord, as we wait on the Lord, it's so often there's, there's another voice inside of us questioning, isn't there something else I could be doing during this time? 
Isn't there some, something I could be giving my life to? Isn't there another cause? Isn't there another person I could be following? And so because of that, the Christian life feels costly. And yet the scriptures tell us that everything that we give up while we are waiting for the Lord is that which would just tire us anyway, that which would just hurt us anyway, that which would just shake us anyway. And so living our lives committed to other things will one day see us leaving this world with nothing. And yet living our lives waiting for the Lord will one day see us leaving this world to everything. We will see God, he said. And so for now, God promises us in Isaiah 40 that as we wait, He will strengthen us while we do. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so only in Jesus can God swap the weariness, the tiredness, the discomfort of your soul for the energy, for the fulfillment, for the comfort of Christ. And so you have been made for God and your heart will be restless until it finds its rest in the one who made your heart, God himself. And so put your faith in Jesus this morning. Put your hope in Jesus this morning. Wait! for the Lord this morning. Perhaps for you that means re-hoping, re-trusting, re-waiting for the Lord. Committing afresh to put your trust in Him. Wherever you're at, this is the gift being held out to all of us today, that God has come into the world in Jesus, that Christmas is this opportunity to not miss it. God is saying to us, He is nudging us, Check this out, bud. Don't miss it. Something amazing is before you. Something epic is happening right now. God is offering you and our world a chance to rejoice, to rest, and to receive God's love in Jesus. And so don't leave the gift wrapped under the tree. Receive it, unwrap it, live it out, the incredible joy and freedom that it is to be reconciled to the one who made you. So if you want to do that today, feel free uh, to talk to me after the service. Uh, I know the person you came with definitely wants to talk to you about it. So have a conversation with them uh, on the way home. But don't miss this moment. Put your hope in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that Jesus is your son whom you have sent into the world that though we are a people so prone to weariness, so prone to discomfort, so prone to be searching for things to relieve that weariness, Lord, you have provided it for us in Jesus. Lord, may we see your massiveness, your mightiness, your majesty in what you have done for us in Jesus. That you have not left us exiled, you have not left us separated, you have not left us away from home, but you have come to us in Jesus that we would come home to you. And so Lord, for some of us in this place, we pray that you would reignite the flame in our hearts, that we might feel that comfort, we might feel that warmth by your Holy Spirit as you put and set our hope afresh in Jesus. For some of us here this morning, we pray that for the very first time, we would encounter Jesus and see him as the only thing that in spite of everything else that we've tried to find an identity in and everything else we've tried to find rest in, Lord, may we see finally that Jesus is the only one because we were made for you. So Lord, help us walk in the way in which we've been made. Help us walk to Jesus today. It's in his mighty name we pray. Amen.